For our next keynote, please welcome VP Ads and Business Platform at Facebook, Mark Rabkin, for an interview with senior reporter, business insider, Tanya Dua. How's everyone doing? I don't know if we're gonna be able to match up with all the fire stuff you just saw, but we're gonna try our best. Um, Mark, thank you so much for being here. Thank in you. the interest of time, I'm gonna dive right in. Um, are we going through a retail apocalypse? And if yes, then why? Well, uh, you know, I keep following the updates and I feel like it keeps getting delayed a little bit. Maybe to end of this year, maybe next year. Um, I think in-store and just retail has so much lasting power, it creates different experiences. And as long as we navigate all the consumer changes and all the, all the things people want to do this month that's very different than they wanted to do six months ago, I think we're gonna be okay. So in, 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 in other words, it's an evolution. So how have you seen uh, the consumer journey um, or the consumer intent um, and behavior evolve? Yeah, I think from, from my seat at Facebook, the biggest change is just consumers proving again and again how quickly they can get into a new form of either interaction or consumption. So if we look at stories, for instance, we have something like 500 million monthly users of stories on Instagram, we have 450 million on WhatsApp and 300 million uh, on Facebook and Messenger, which is huge numbers. Then we have the rise of business messaging. It's huge in the developing world kind of standard. It's now starting to become a lot more prevalent in the developed world. And we have 10 billion messages between people and businesses exchanged every month already. I think for messaging, you know, People are getting used to messaging with their rideshare driver, with their delivery folks, with businesses in general, and I think it's gonna come much more broad. But then when we go deep into shopping, there's a whole other set of evolutions. And I think people have been talking about this in the industry a lot, that the internet has solved buying and made it very efficient and very convenient but the shopping experiences, a rich discovery, hearing a brand story, that's all still pretty nascent. And we're just seeing an insatiable demand for that across the platforms. People are hacking social media left and right to find some way to make commerce work. They're using groups, they're using messages, they're using their profiles, they're using Instagram feeds to cobble together a shop of some kind. So when we lean into behaviors like that, we get things like Facebook Marketplace where you just structure it a little bit, the groups that already existed, and now we have 800 million people using Marketplace to buy and sell every month. And the really shocking thing to me is these are all 100 million X numbers. All of these numbers I just mentioned were pretty much zero, either exactly zero or almost zero two years ago. So the shifts just keep on coming. And I get feedback a lot from customers, from partners, uh, saying, Facebook, you guys need to make up your mind. Why are you pitching me on this new thing? Six months ago, it was a different thing. Now it's this new hotness. Which one should I do? And my answer is, we're kind of in the same boat. The consumers are pulling us in these directions. We're trying to innovate on top of it, but we're at the mercy of that tidal wave just like everyone else is. So everything's, in its essence, changing at a very rapid clip. Yeah. Um, are there certain industries that are evolving faster or more differently than others? Yeah, so when you have a new form of media consumption, like stories, um, that literally you have three to 500 million people doing it in three places, that's gonna affect every business and any industry who wants to communicate a message to people, which is every industry. But I think shopping is getting a double whammy because there's all the just marketing, how do I get my message? Where are people reading? Where are people watching video? But then on top of that, the structured commerce 
coming to social media is really amplifying everything. And as people start to really shop online and discover, and as your Instagram profile becomes a much better reflection of what your brand stands for to young people, it puts a lot of pressure on uh, traditional retailers and retail in general to make the online world and the offline world much more holistic, like Eric was just talking about. So it seems like the, the walls between offline and online are blurring increasingly, correct? Yeah. Um, you know, if you're a brand, uh, how should you be kind of addressing all of these changes? Is it using all the new tools you're talking about, stories, um, you know, Instagram dynamic ads, or is it internal changes and bringing those about? Because those are much harder, harder to actually implement. Yeah. So, I mean, zooming out, what do consumers want? They want great experiences holistically across both. It's pretty quaint if you ask a young person to, to consider that your brand, the in-store version, and your brand.com operate as different entities and have different policies or might have different merchandise or promotion. They're just like really strange to them. So there's a lot of pressure to make this work better together. Um, as you mentioned, though, changing traditional structures and methods in the organization is pretty hard. I think everyone is pretty much convinced that some change needs to happen. It's how do you do it? And one push I have is, you know, for in-store, it's carrying so many responsibilities, so many duties for a retail business right now. For it's often supplying a lot of the margin. It carries a lot of categories of merchandise. It's responsible for brand retention and kind of the deeper brand love a lot of the time. It's hard to innovate on it when it's doing so many things. So I'd love to see companies try to unburden in-store retail a little bit, figure out which parts of the responsibilities it's carrying can be done by online. Maybe certain merchandise categories can be just serviced online only or mostly online. Just kind of free up a little bit of room for the in-store team to experiment with these new things that are coming. But you gotta, you got to get the teams working a little bit in a different way to, to achieve that. Again, is this separate for, you know, let's say, direct-to-consumer disruptors versus traditional retailers? Um, how should they be kind of tailoring yeah. their strategies depending on what end of the spectrum they're on? Yeah, I, I, think, I think it's different because they're coming at it from opposite ends of the spectrum. I think fundamentally, biggest success predictor for a shopping or a retail brand today is the consumers are just doing something different every six months, they're not letting up. So building an organization that's able to respond to things every six months and see it as a big opportunity, opportunity to compete, opportunity to try new things, instead of an additional burden, that's the biggest determinator of success right now. And I think that's a massively undersung reason why disruptors are so competitive. A lot of times people talk about the direct-to-consumer or a different supply chain or a different product development cycle, but I think a lot of it is just by virtue of being newer and smaller, having a team that is super happy to respond to new things every six months. I kind of lived this myself in the software industry. I went to um, Berkeley for nerdy stuff and when, when I went to school for computer science, we had Windows 95, and then the next one was Windows 98. And those are three years apart. And that was, that was how fast software development was. And it was the process to update something like that was six different teams working for six months each, one at a time, like handing off a partially completed thing. And then today, like, you know, all of our phones and computers are just blowing up with software updates every morning but we've grown to expect that we always have the latest and greatest. And what, what connects how a disruptive brand or a DTC brand works in software now is they have what I like to call Noah's Ark teams. So you, if you want to meet the consumer flood, this new behavior coming in, you have to put at least two of every kind of person onto one boat at the same time. When I, when I work uh, you know, at Facebook, we're developing new products. Our teams are something like six engineers, 
two marketing people, two data scientists to help us make sense of everything, two product managers to plan it and keep it all on track, two designers to make the product experience great, content strategy for the narrative and the messages we're writing. And because they're all in one room and sharing a goal, we can iterate on a two week cycle, one, one month cycle, and definitely not a six month to a year cycle, because if you're at that speed, you're gonna miss every consumer train that leaves the station. So it's about getting faster, more nimble, more agile, and one way of doing that is, as you said, your great the analogy, arc. the Noah's Ark. Um, can we get examples, just for audience takeaways, of uh, brands that you've seen actually implement these and, and do well for themselves? Yeah. And a lot of brands are trying it. All the, all the direct-to-consumer are doing it automatically. I think Dick's Sporting Goods is a big brand that did a great job this holiday season with it. They implemented a really aggressive test and learn cycle where they were trying new things every two weeks and they were able to drive a huge improvement over their traditional marketing, both in-store and online through the same campaigns on, on our apps. And they are what you would call a traditional retailer. Yes. Um, what about on the other end of the spectrum? Um, any direct-to-consumer brands or disruptor brands that you think um, have great models that you know other retailers could emulate? Yeah, uh, my team uh, did a research trip to Turkey recently, and, and the big trend there for a lot of the direct-to-consumer brands was what we're seeing here as well is going back to the physical stores. So I think direct-to-consumer brands are actually facing the opposite challenge, which is how do I build a physical retail competency? How do I ensure retention and brand value and everything through, through in-store messaging? And it's, uh, it's particularly prevalent in the developing world right now because a lot of the top local brands started online. So we know things are changing. Um, offline and online are merging increasingly. You have to have a holistic strategy that tackles both, um, how can Facebook enter the picture and be helpful? Yeah, our, our philosophy is to kind of try to do our best from the position where we sit to make all this fragmentation and all these changes tractable for all of you. So for example, we're building a store sales optimization. It's a part of our ad engine that can optimize for actual transactions and cart sizes in, in store, exactly how you optimize for all of your online objectives. And what we're trying to do is making sure that when you integrate with something like that, you need additional data flow of in-store data in order to make something like that work. That integration can be slow, it requires many parts of the company. We wanna make sure that an integration like that is a asset that you retain that you can then use to surf other consumer behavior ways. So if you have that data in there, we want that same data stream to be able uh, to optimize your Instagram shopping experience. If you eventually have a storefront there, we want it to power your ads across the platform. We want to be able to do multi-channel attribution, so the same campaign you don't have to pick. You can drive in-store sales and online sales and actually see how each piece of content is facing off. So we're trying to, to build these kind of reusable channels that make in-store behave in many ways as measurable and as optimizable as online is. What, what about tools specifically um, for online sales? There's been a you know, huge number of tools you've rolled out in the last couple of months. Do you want to talk about some of those? Sure. So I think um, the main innovations are kind of making deeper shopping experience that are more structured on Facebook. Facebook Marketplace is opening storefronts for different businesses. IG shopping is growing really quickly. Um, and in general, Instagram is just an amazing commerce platform. A lot of people open that app with the intent to shop, with the intent to, to look for new things. We've already had 90 million people uh, regularly interacting with shopping tags, which is kind of just catalog items on a post from which you can go to the product page right on the retailer site, and those are incredibly new. So you'll see a lot of evolution from us in making uh, those experiences better and just 
making them become better discovery experiences. Let's talk about custom audiences. Sure. There's been some recent changes. There's there's more changes in the pipeline. Um, you know, for brands that heavily rely on Facebook, um, how does that kind of impact that moving forward? Yeah. So custom audiences is a really really important tool overall that I can't I can't promote or stress enough. And and the reason it's so powerful is it just basically lets you pick any set of people from any CRM you have in your business. If you have a loyalty program, which uh, I think a lot of you do, or if you have an online business, you definitely have the data of who's buying, you can use custom audiences to segment and deliver messages to whoever. So actually, custom audiences is the best first test for in-store because you can just take some CRM data from people who have bought, you can do a couple experiments, maybe re-engagement, maybe trying to get a churned customer to come back, maybe get a top online customer to come in. And the other, the other part that I think is underappreciated is you can create very easy control groups and A-B tests all on your own that work with your own attribution system using custom audiences. So super imp important thing is probably our biggest channel for you to use your data to maximum power on our app. But custom audiences also tap in to data and transparency and data flow, which I think, as we're all aware and I'm keenly aware, are, is a very hot topic right now. Right. Um, you preempted my question. So obviously, I'm sorry. Uh, a lot of um, retailers sitting here have those concerns. Um, yeah. You know, Facebook had a little bit of a tough year last year. Um, one of the hacks was as recent as. October 2018, and of course, Facebook isn't the only company to, to suffer from that, you know. Um, yeah. what, how, how committed are you to, to protecting, um, you know, retailers' data moving forward? Because if they're giving you, there's supposed to be a value exchange, and, and they're trusting you with, with their first-party data, and you supplement that with third-party data. How are you making that more secure, you know, just to wrap things up, because we're running out of time here? Yeah, data... I mean, data is the number one priority for my team right now. When, we, when we're looking at goals, when we're looking at strategy, both utilizing it to make these products better, but changes to make people feel safer and more in control, improve security, improve data handling, all of that. It's the biggest investment I have overall in my team. But I think it's tapping into a pretty important and in some ways a little bit uncomfortable kind of sea change in the world you know, business has kind of grown and thrived on data for the last several years. Anytime we hear a cloud, which every business is on now, those clouds are full of data. Anytime you hear connected home or internet of things, all those things do is generate data all day. Um, so data has been exploding, but at the same time in the last year, it's broken from industry engine room kind of discussions right into the mainstream. It used to be that only industry magazines would talk about data use and transparency. Now, every major newspaper in the world is treating data and privacy as a key thing and, and, and an important issue for society. And rightfully so, right? Of um, course. You know, GDPR rolled around last year. The California law is set to go into effect 2020. It's on everyone's mind. So what sort of a role is Facebook playing in kind of readying um, everyone on its ecosystem for this? So we're trying to lead an effort to make this, I call it the data supply chain, the thing that powers all of our businesses together, a lot more cleaner and understandable for people. And I think um, there's a lot of uncertainty and hesitation about that in the industry, but in my view, the ship has clearly sailed on that one, and we really need to get on it. People and eventually governments not that far away are taking a huge interest in this. And we all need to work together to find the right products to make people feel good about it. When, when I talk to data privacy advocates and experts, they tell us if you show too much data, you're inundating the person under a mountain that they can't sift through. If it's not enough data, it doesn't feel transparent, it's not clear enough. We need to do that product design together. And what I see Facebook's role in there given our position, given how much data we have, given the consumer relationships, to try to lead and innovate our way to 
a thing that feels good to people. And I'm pretty optimistic about that because we've gone through that in other mediums. We have a do not call list for phone. We have an unsubscribe link at the bottom of every single email we send, and we're all okay. So I think even though it's uncomfortable, there's not really a choice to delay here. We have to make 2019 and then possibly a little bit into 2020 the years where we figure out how to make this great for people because all of our brand relationships depend on people being in control and loving what they see from my brand, from your brand, rather than being annoyed or creeped out by it and to opt in to seeing more stuff and being able to manage it because fundamentally they want your brands, they want your products, they want amazing deals. Well, on that note, um, let's wrap up here because we're out of time. Thank you so much, Thank you, Tanya. Thank you.